Well, welcome everyone to Street Science. Street Science is an evening science presentation series put on by UAF Northwest Campus here in Nome, as well as UAF Alaska Sea Grant, also here in Nome. And this is the, the work office tonight. And we're gonna have two speakers tonight. So what we'll do is we'll have one, uh, we'll have Andy Ramey go first and then Rob Kaler go second. We'll have a question period after Andy. We won't keep it open too long. Then we'll let uh, Rob go and then we'll have questions until everyone, uh, either the, the speakers are begging for mercy or everyone is finished answering their questions. We'll go with either. And the topics they're talking about tonight are very important to this region. And we are very grateful that they have have uh, tuned in tonight to help uh, illuminate what, what's going on in our region. So our first speaker tonight is Andy Ramey. He is a research geneticist with the U.S. Geological Survey in Anchorage. And the U.S. Geological Survey in Anchorage is the research arm for um, birds. Is that, is that right, Andy? You can. Yeah, for the Department of Interior in general, but birds included. Yep. Okay. And the second speaker will be Rob Kaler. He serves as the US Fish and Wildlife Service Seabird Specialist, and he's in Anchorage. And the, the US Fish and Wildlife Service is the management arm of the Department of the Interior for the birds. So this is a great combo to have management and research, and we've got two topics. So it doesn't get any better than this, although the topics tonight are a little bit, um, the stuff of what we've been living with and what we are wondering about, both two very interesting topics. So with that, we're gonna learn more about the Bering Strait birds. We're gonna start off with avian influenza and finish off with die-off events. So pull up a chair and don't be shy to um, think about your questions and uh, deliver them at the end. If we have any callers, know that callers get priority in a uh, Zoom call. I don't see any callers at this time, but they may be um, coming in later. And so everything will stop uh, because it's so horrible to be a caller on a Zoom call. The callers get priority. They get first in line in questions and whatnot. So thank you very much. I will be monitoring the chat box. And with that, Andy Ramey, take it away and tell us all about this new um, highly pathogenic avian influenza we're dealing with. Thank you so much for coming. Great, thank you, Gay, and hello, everyone. So this evening, Rob Kaler and I would like to speak with you about a wild bird mortality events. And so specifically, as Gay previewed, I would like to provide you with an update about an ongoing outbreak of bird flu or highly pathogenic avian influenza that, are, that is now affecting wild birds here in Alaska. And subsequently, Rob is going to provide an update on continuing efforts to better understand seabird die-offs in the Bering Strait region. So I hope we have plenty of time to take your questions at the end of this presentation. So I'd like to start by recognizing that we all know that birds die for many reasons. So often when birds die is from natural processes, which may play important roles in healthy ecosystems. Therefore, in most circumstances, it is not considered uncommon or unusual to encounter small numbers of dead birds. However, when mortality events are observed, it may indicate that something is abnormal, uh, something abnormal is occurring within the ecosystem. So for the purposes of this talk, I'll be defining a wild bird mortality event as the death of numerous birds in the same area during a short time interval. So, so mortality events can occur for a variety of reasons, such as lack of food, exposure to contaminants, or infection with viruses, bacteria, or parasites that cause disease. So this evening, I'd like to talk about one cause of avian mortality events that is currently affecting wild birds in North America. Specifically, I'd like to talk about a particular type of bird flu that is referred to as highly pathogenic avian influenza. So I suspect that many of you have heard of bird flu in the past. So the term bird flu is commonly used to refer to the infection of many different hosts with an influenza virus that originated from a bird. Bird flu can therefore be used to refer to infections in wild birds, domestic poultry, wild mammals, 
domestic livestock, and humans. So because the term bird flu can refer to any part of the slide, it can be confusing. There are some types of bird flu that naturally occur in wild birds. Birds usually appear to be perfectly healthy when infected with these types of bird flu. You may have previously heard about researchers finding this type of bird flu in MERS from the Bering Strait region. This type of bird flu is considered normal. That is, not all bird flu makes birds sick or causes them to die. Sometimes bird flu viruses that naturally occur in wild birds spill over into domestic poultry. Oftentimes, poultry infected by these types of viruses also appear to be perfectly healthy. Only a small proportion of bird flu viruses make domestic poultry sick. Viruses that cause disease and death among chickens and turkeys are termed highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses. The tendency for viruses to cause serious disease and death among birds or to become highly pathogenic typically only occurs after viruses are introduced into poultry. Highly pathogenic viruses that evolve in poultry are readily spread among chickens and turkeys and may result in the death or destruction of large numbers of domestic birds. These viruses are very costly to the poultry industry in the United States and around the world. The spread of highly pathogenic avian influenza from poultry to wild birds, depicted here with a red arrow, has only become, become common within the past 20 years. So prior to 2002, there had been only one outbreak of highly pathogenic in wild birds globally. This occurred in turns in South Africa in 1961. This is depicted by a green shaded circle on the far left of the timeline on the left side of this so on the left side of this slide. Things have changed. Outbreaks in wild birds have become more common and more geographically widespread. This is depicted by the abundance of uh, green and gray shaded circles towards the right side of this timeline. The geographic spread of highly pathogenic avian influenza in wild birds is also depicted by the proliferation of red on the maps and the figures on the right and by the height of the bars on the plots below these maps. So since 2005, outbreaks of highly pathogenic avian influenza have become more common through time in wild birds inhabiting Africa, Asia, Europe, and here in North America. The effects of highly pathogenic avian influenza on wild birds can be extremely variable. Some birds, especially dabbling ducks, like mallards and pintails, can be asymptomatic, meaning that they appear to be healthy, even when they're infected with highly pathogenic avian influenza. Other birds may show signs of disease and then recover. Signs of disease displayed by wild birds may include a lack of coordination, stumbling, inability to stand upright, inability to fly, swimming in circles, a twisted neck, or paralysis. Individuals of the same species may be differentially affected by highly pathogenic avian influenza. For example, some geese infected with highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses may appear healthy, whereas other infected birds may become sick. Some wild birds die from highly pathogenic avian influenza. Mortality events caused by highly pathogenic avian influenza sometimes involve very large numbers of birds. For example, as part of a recent mortality event in Israel, more than 8,000 cranes are estimated to have died. In another mortality event involving barnacle geese in the United Kingdom, as many as 16,000 birds may have died. Currently, North America is experiencing one of the largest outbreaks of highly pathogenic avian influenza in the recorded history of this continent, which is also only the second outbreak to affect wild birds in the US and Canada. This outbreak was first detected in late December of 2021. As of today, 26 May, there have been detections throughout large portions of the United States and Canada. More than 350 poultry premises have been affected in the United States alone, resulting in the death or destruction of 38 million domestic birds. 
there have also been more than 1,600 confirmed detections from wild birds in the United States and Canada, some of which have been from apparently healthy animals, whereas many have been from sick or dead birds. The number of wild bird detections during the past six months is more than 15 times greater than the total number of detections of highly pathogenic avian influenza and wild birds in Canada and the United States during all prior outbreaks. Some of the most common species affected by highly pathogenic avian influenza as part of the current outbreak include mallard, lesser scop, green winged teal, snow goose, Ross's goose, Canada goose, bald eagle, red-tailed hawk, turkey vulture, and great horned owl. Many of the waterfowl that have been identified as being infected with highly pathogenic avian influenza have appeared to be healthy, though some individuals have also been reported to be sick or to have died. Raptors represent birds that have consistently been reported to be adversely affected during the current outbreak of high path in North America. That is, reports of highly pathogenic avian influenza in eagles, hawks, falcons, and owls have been confirmed from sick or dead birds. Although the current outbreak certainly poses a significant threat to the health of both wild and domestic birds in North America, the Center for Disease Control and, Conve and Prevention, or CDC, has reported that, that this outbreak poses low risk to public health. For example, since the current outbreak was first detected in North America, there has been only one human case in the United States reported by the CDC. The affected person had extensive exposure to infected domestic poultry and fully recovered after reporting fatigue. Recently, there have also been several reports of foxes affected by highly pathogenic avian influenza in the United States and Canada and a single report of a skunk affected by highly pathogenic avian influenza in Alberta, Canada. So if you observe sick or dead birds that you suspect might be affected by highly pathogenic avian influenza, please call the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Alaska Sick and Dead Bird Hotline at 1-866-527-3358. This may be a helpful number to put into your cell phone. Reports are most helpful when they convey specific locations, the species affected, and information on how many birds appear to be sick or to have died. If you can take photos or make a short video, this is also extremely helpful. Please do not pick up carcasses, move dead birds, or try to capture or handle sick birds. Your observations are, and reports are currently the best way to help document the effects of highly pathogenic avian influenza during the outbreak. If you don't feel comfortable reporting your observations directly to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, please contact Gay Sheffield. Gay can help you to report observations, may also help with response as appropriate. So Gay, if you would please be willing, uh, please provide your contact information in the chat. You bet, we will do. Thank you. So for information on the distribution of highly pathogenic avian influenza in Alaska and the species of wild birds affected, I wanna direct you to the website indicated at the bottom of the slide, which is maintained by the Office of the State Veterinarian. And again, Gay, if you're able to provide this, I'd appreciate that, otherwise I'll put it in the chat a little bit later. So this website conveys the most current publicly available information regarding the ongoing outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza in wild and domestic birds specific to Alaska and is updated regularly. So as you can see, as of today, 26 May, there have been 21 confirmed detections of highly pathogenic avian influenza in wild birds here in Alaska. Detections have been in geese and bald eagles from the Aleutians, South Central, Southeast and interior Alaska. There has also been a single confirmed detection in a red fox in the Aleutians. So far, there have not been any confirmed detections of highly pathogenic avian influenza in wild birds in the Bering Strait region. So for additional information on the distribution of highly pathogenic avian influenza in North America, I want to direct you to the website listed at the bottom of this slide. 
And again, either Gay or I will share that in the chat. This website hosted by the USGS National Wildlife Health Center provides a map with locations for all confirmed detections of highly pathogenic avian influenza in domestic and wild birds and wild mammals as part of the current outbreak. This website is also updated regularly, though information specific to Alaska may not be as current as conveyed on the webpage previously highlighted. So for information on the wild bird species affected by highly pathogenic avian influenza in the United States, I wanna direct you to another website listed at the bottom of this slide, which again, we will share. This USDA website provides information on the species, location, and health status of wild birds sampled in the US from which highly pathogenic avian influenza detections have been made. This website is also updated regularly, though once again, information specific to Alaska may not be as current as conveyed on the webpage maintained by the Office of the State Veterinarian. For additional information on the distribution of highly pathogenic avian influenza in Canada and species of wild birds affected in that country, I'd like to direct you to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency website that's also listed at the bottom of this slide. And again, we will share. This website provides the same type of information for Canada as conveyed uh, by sites maintained by the USGS and USDA. So if you have any questions or concerns regarding human health and safety on account of highly pathogenic avian influenza in wild or domestic birds, please consult the CDC website listed at the bottom of this slide that again, we will share. The CDC is the lead agency when it comes to bird flu and human health. So for guidance on steps hunters can take to reduce the risk of highly pathogenic avian influenza to human and domestic animal health, I'd like to direct you to USDA and US Fish and Wildlife websites listed on this slide and that we will share. So on these web pages, hunters can find numerous tips and best practices for protecting human and animal health while participating in subsistence or sport harvest activities. So finally, provided here are a few contacts in Alaska that may also be able to provide you with additional information on highly pathogenic avian influenza. So I want to re-emphasize that the best number for reporting wild birds that you think may be affected by bird flu is the US Fish and Wildlife Service Alaska Sick and Dead Bird Hotline listed towards the top of the slide. And if you prefer a local contact, please talk with Gay Sheffield. My contact information is also included at the bottom of this slide. So I'm gonna now turn things over to Rob Kaler, who's gonna provide us with important information about potential causes of mortality events in seabirds other than highly pathogenic avian influenza. Sound like a plan, Gay? Yep, all right. Well. Thank you very much, Andy. That was a, a very good walkthrough on the avian influenza. I know I've got questions. Let's see if there's any burning questions from the audience, and then we'll move on with Rob and have more questions at the end. Anybody have a burning question for Andy regarding avian influenza? All right. I've got some burning ones, but I'm going to wait till the end. So we can, get, we can keep going. And so thank you so much. And this, we actually have news, new news from today and so forth. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that maybe a little bit at the, at the um, when Rob's done. And Rob, we're really looking forward. We have been living through uh, many years of um, dead birds. So that's not new, multi-species seabird die-offs in the Bering Strait region. And um, thank you so much. Take it away. We wanna hear what, what happened. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank, thanks very much to Andy for sharing this time with me. And of course, thank you very much, Gay, for um, organizing. I was going to come up with some kind of joke about um, the fans of the straight science. I don't know, bearing straight science heads. I don't know what we are, but I'm a, I'm a big fan. And thanks very much to Gay for hosting this and, and leading this on uh, sometimes Wednesdays, but usually Thursdays. My wife is always do we need to eat dinner early so that you can run down to the basement and uh, join the Bering Strait Science stuff? So many thanks. So 
Again, I'm, I'm Rob Kaler uh, with US Fish and Wildlife Service, Migratory Bird Management. I'm based in Anchorage. And um, many thanks to Andy for providing uh, some in, uh, information on the highly pathogenic avian influenza. So we'll kind of, we'll, I'm, I'll give some background here, um, but I do want to acknowledge my partners, the, the banner across the, the bottom of the screen. I hope that you can see that. Um, have contributed immensely and I'm, I would not have a lot to talk about if it weren't for these partners, uh, which of course includes Gay and the Bering Strait region. Um, and of course the, the, the lands that we work in. So I, I will be talking about some of the, the at sea data that uh, Kathy Kulitz and Liz Lebunsky from the Migratory Bird Office here in, in Anchorage have, have collected. But um, yeah, Quiana to all of our partners and the funders and all the support and many thanks for letting us come into your waters. Um, so the information, uh, so why are we interested in seabirds? About 80% of all North American seabirds breed in Alaska. Uh, a long, you know, 34,000 miles of coastline. I, I, it's a variation of numbers, but I think about 34,000 miles of coastline, a lot of seabirds. So that amounts to about 30 million breeding seabirds in Alaska. Um, additionally, Alaska is also the home to another 30 million seabirds, which migrate from the Southern Hemisphere, New Zealand and Australia um, and the tropical Pacific, just to take advantage of our cold and highly productive waters. And uh, what are the seabirds telling us? So we know that birds have been dying and washing up on shores. People are observing that. But what are they, what are they telling us? Um, as a management agency, Fish and Wildlife Service, we, we tout seabirds as indicators of the status of the marine ecosystem and the health of that, owing to the fact that seabirds live the majority of their lives at sea. So they only come to shore to breed. Um, and that provides a chance to monitor the long-term population trends. So that's different from marine mammals and, and other creatures that live in the sea. Um, these guys come to shore and that's an opportunity that we, we use and that's we tout as the indicators of the, the marine ecosystem. So most seabirds uh, breed in very large colonies. Those colonies can range from tens of hundreds to hundreds of thousands. Uh, and many of the seabirds don't actually mature until the age five or more. So they actually have to leave the nest um, and then survive and then actually come back. So they might come back on, onto the land uh, before they're breeding just to see what adults are doing. So, and I think many of you have heard of Wisdom, the Laysan Albatross. I think she's over 70 years old now, banded in 1951 at Midway Atoll. So that's an example of a, a long lived bird um, and many seabirds are. So most seabirds lay a single egg and once that chick hatches, uh, it's typically attended by both the, the mom and the dad, both parents until it fledges the nest. So that's quite a bit of commitment from both mom and dad during the breeding season. And sometimes that breeding season can last uh, 60 days or more. So they're going to offshore to, to feed themselves. And then once it hatches, they're, you know, so a lot of work. Uh, parents, parent offspring conflict is a, a very fascinating topic for me and something that animals deal with. And I'm sure I don't have children, I just have a dog, but Current offspring conflict, I think uh, seabirds are kind of a fascinating focus on that. During the nesting period, adults can forage great distances from the colonies, many miles. And in the case of uh, lace and albatross, they're going hundreds of miles to come up to our productive waters here in Alaska and then get back down to, to Midway Atoll, for example. So compared to grouse or ptarmigan or chickens, if you're more familiar with that, which live about five to seven years, uh, they, you know, they breed their, you know, chickens and grouse, they breed in their first year or two, um, lay nine eggs, which is completely opposite of what seabirds are doing. Uh, they hatch and, and have to um, provide a lot of resources for their young. So, um, and then we consider seabirds as a top predator with many consuming forage fish. So for example, the Pacific sand lance in the upper left, or sorry, the upper right, um, are found in the near shore, experience good years and bad years. And then sand lance are high quality prey items, rich in nutrients and calories. And then similar to the capelin on the left side, capelin and juvenile Arctic cod in the Bering Strait region, 
are associated with cold water and also rich in nutrients and calories. And then with increasing ocean temperatures, which we've seen in the Bering Strait region you know, for the last many several years, uh, we've seen a decline in the capelin and an increase in species like juvenile walleye pollock, which are lower prey quality items compared to the sandlets or capelin or the Arctic cod. And so juvenile walleye, walleye pollock um, and its lower caloric value are similar. And I've used this term, I was out on a boat with some young kids last Sunday, uh, junk food. That's what, <laughs> I use the term junk food, these warm, warmer water fish, less nutrient rich. And that's kind of what stunk, stuck with the, these young kids. And I'll have to, I don't know, maybe that was great. But so lastly, the euphosids and the copepods, which are generally very dense, um, energy-wise, and then auklets um, eat and provide their young with these zooplankton. Forage fish, not so much for the, for the auklets, but forage fish are also relying on the zooplankton as well. So as a quick example, the lower right, I've got the metabolic rate for common MERS, which are thought to consume somewhere between tw uh, 10 and 30% of their 100 gram body mass every day, which is compared to about 90 to 300 fish per day, depending on the size of that fish. So that's a, a lot of not only fishing, but that's a lot of catching. Um, and so now that we know seabirds, why they're cool, um, their role in the ecosystem as indicators, beginning in 2013, the ocean was signaling a warming trend. I think many of you in the Bering Strait region know this. And by 2014, oceanographers and climate scientists uh, were beginning to talk about the blob, an unusually warm mass of water in the Pacific, stretched from the Bering Ocean, or sorry, the Baja, California, uh, to the Gulf of Alaska. And then similar, another warming event was in the Bering Strait region, 2018, 2019. And that was that um, extreme lack of sea ice in the Bering Strait. Um, so going to that blob, the 2014-2016 marine heat wave, uh, this picture here is from East Amatuli Island. It's south of the Kenai Peninsula in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, this is in uh, September 2010. You see that there's all um, adults are sitting there. They've got their young. The young are about to fledge, these common mers. And then in 2015, when they went back, um, they, the biologists basically found that there was nobody home. We don't know if they actually uh, even arrived there, but this was the first time in 30 years of monitoring at East Amatuli that a complete breeding failure had been reported. And of course, this coincided with that 2015-2016 mass mortality event in the Gulf of Alaska with MERS, where estimated now is somewhere between 400,000 to 1 million common MERS were estimated to have died due to starvation. So this figure, um, it's, it's kind of, it's not a great figure, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll be honest. But the point of it is historically seabird die-offs, um, this is a timeline, the die-offs are rare and typically only associated with strong El Nino events or avian disease. This timeline shows the start, you know, 1970, um, Bristol Bay. This is for Alaska, but uh, mostly impacted every few years. And these were associated with die-offs. And then once you see in 2015, there have been annual die-offs. And since 2017, those, those events have occurred mostly in the Bering Strait region and the Bering Sea uh, and the Aleutians um, and the Bristol Bay area. So I, I won't. Yeah, it's a great, <laughs> took, me a, took me an hour to make this figure, but uh, you get it. Basically the point is uh, we're having seabird die-offs every year in the Bering Strait region. And so working with a lot of partners, uh, banners across the left, there are icons in the banner on the left side of the screen, um, showing the magnitude of the die-offs indicated by the size of the circle. And as you can see, we've, we've gotten a little bit more sophisticated in 2017. And, and this is coordinated with our partners at the Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey Team at University of Washington. They help consolidate the reports that we're getting from folks in the Bering Strait region, for example, from, from, uh, from Gay, from the University of Alaska, Fairbanks, Alaska Sea Grant. Um, and so I'll just, here's the 2021 map 
And what we're showing here is uh, the size of the circle indicates the number of birds, the color indicates the, uh, the time of the month, and then the n value, of course, has given you the, the, the number of birds that were reported. And these birds, is, by the time we get a report, by the, I should say, by the time I get a report here in Anchorage, uh, this is a minimal, uh, the minimum estimate of birds that were actually reported, um, sorry, that probably actually died, got washed up on a beach, were reported or observed, and made it back to me. Um, and then the duration, I guess, is the other part, part to, to emphasize. So beginning to get reports in 2021 um, from Gay uh, in May, and then extending into uh, September here. And we actually got a, you know, five reports from October. And we know that seabirds are dying. They die, we understand that, but this is, this is unusual in the terms of the ongoing, the magnitude, the duration, and the, the frequency, so. So if we work quickly enough, and work with great partners, and not to um, overemphasize Gay's help, but thank you, Gay. Um, we're able to get fresh carcasses and those submitted to the National Wildlife Health Center at uh, the USGS in Madison. So in addition to all these reports of carcasses, um, which we again consider minimum numbers. So you see the top, this is 2017, the, the table is showing 2017 to 2021. Um, we see that this table is summarizing the results. And really, I want to emphasize that across the top, we see that the range is going from 1,600 birds, um, a peak in 2019, 9,000 9, birds, uh, mostly shearwaters, which they don't breed in Alaska. They come up here from the, the Southern Hemisphere. And then last year, 2,200 birds. Every bird that is received by the National Wildlife Health Center is, is swabbed and tested for avian influenza. So they might not actually do a necropsy, but they will examine and test it for, or sorry, not examine, but they will test it for avian influenza. And so the point, if you look at the far right side of the table, we've submitted 69, and we is the royal we, many thanks to Gay, um, 69 were submitted, 45 of those were examined. All 45 were swabbed for avian influenza. Only one came back and that's um, either an H5 or an H7, which were, yeah, it was not a highly pathic, highly pathogenic uh, avian influenza. So Andy talked about highly pathogenic to poultry and this was not one of those. So those cases do occur, seabirds and other birds, gulls do have um, avian influenza, but not the highly pathogenic avian influenza, but we do continue to monitor that. The other point would be the avian botulism type C that's not known to transfer to humans, but Middleton Island in the Gulf of Alaska uh, did have a die-off event. It was very punctuated end of July to early August uh, 2021, um, which is, I contrast that to what the reports we've been getting from the Bering Strait region, uh, where it's prolonged, so something uh, more owing to emaciation, and that's what this slide hopefully emphasizes, that cause of death is, has been um, essentially emaciation. Um, we're not trying to not, yeah, we don't want to rule out disease. We want to keep a, a, a finger on that pulse, but essentially right now, birds are in poor body condition, emaciated, underweight, um, but we'll continue to monitor that. But as of right now, um, we believe all the birds have died due to emaciation, a lack of food in the, in the ecosystem. And I'll talk about that here shortly. The other thing, harmful algal blooms, so saxitoxin and domoic acid, uh, the birds that get sent to Madison uh, with the National Wildlife Health Center, they sample tissues, send those back to Anchorage to the USGS Alaska Science Center, and they've been testing for the presence or absence of saxitoxin domoic, domoic acid. And those have also come up um, below detection levels. We'll continue to monitor that. You see that there has been some cases where it was positive 2020, um, but again, the cause of death right now has been ruled out, um, has been uh, owing to emaciation based on the, the National Wildlife Health Center examination. Um, 
So I'll continue along here. We're uh, six minutes after. So sea ice extent. So the seabird die-offs in the Bering Strait region. We know that at the same time, um, and this figure here is showing that sea ice extent from 2013, as you see the panel, um, the minimum extent was documented in 2018. And so I'll also try to emphasize that it's not just the extent, but it's also the age of that sea ice. And with that age, the sea ice thickness. And I think I, I'll speed through this as well. I think most of you on the, on the uh, straight science call tonight know this, but when sea ice diminishes, uh, such as it has in the Bering Strait, Strait and Chukchi, um, major ecological shifts can be expected. This slide is from Cooper, um, many thanks to him, but as shown this, these twin diagrams, the less extensive sea ice will lead to a lower deposition of sea ice in spring bloom algae, which is the bottom figure, and a lower bio, uh, biomass of the benthic or bottom community. So fish and zooplankton will increase in importance and pelagic feeding whales, such as killer whales and humpbacks, will become more important uh, than the sea ice associate, associated uh, bowheads and benthic uh, feeding pinnipeds. So for the pinna, yeah, for the benthic and bottom feeders, um, or I guess benthic meaning the bottom feeders, uh, changes in prey or changes in sea ice for gray whales will shift in distribution related to the decrease, decrease of prey amphipods and opportunistic feeding, um, opportunistic feeding on euphosids, uh, which may stay longer near Ukdiavik to feed. Uh, for walrus, the loss of sea ice means the loss of ice to rest on while nursing and calving, as well as providing access to the Chukchi feeding areas where they might not otherwise be able to access. Um, and similarly, diving ducks like eiders will lose places to rest. And in general, the lack of sea ice means more turbulent waters owing to wind action. And so will there be winners and losers? Kind of like this, the stock market, um, thinking about how ecology matches up with the stock market. Uh, there will be winners, there will be losers. So these figures here, this is actually from Kathy Kulitz, uh, retired Fish and Wildlife Service, but Based on information collected during at sea surveys of seabirds, uh, the map on the left here shows the, the total change in seabird abundance. This is total seabirds measured uh, by birds per kilometer squared. And you see a comparison between 2007 and 2016 with 2017 and 19, kind of a cold period versus a warm period. The increase is shown in red and the decrease is indicated by blue. So if you Blur your eyes, you see that more red north of the Bering Strait and more blue south of the Strait. So there is evidence based on this that warm conditions are having effects on seabird abundance in the Northern Bering Sea. Uh, and then similar kind of driving in, similar to this, that previous map where the red indicates the increase in abundance and blue indicates the decrease in seabird abundance. These three figures are showing the increase of the, the increase or the, the move north of MERS on the left side, which is a, a piscivorous or fish eating seabird um, and auklets, which consume plankton. They've also increased north of St. Lawrence Island where they have reported to a, a, a low or failed breeding efforts in 2017, 2019. Um, but there was a, a, and this is again, Kathy's figures, but there was not, uh, a post-breeding movement northward. So that's where you see in the center panel there for least auklets. Usually they would have moved further north, but they failed in 2017, 2019. Um, so again, the, and then on the right side is short-tailed uh, shearwaters breeding in the Southern hemisphere coming up to our productive waters. Um, and they eat krill and fish, but you see they have also appeared to move further north in 2017 and 19 in the Bering Strait. So again, we're seeing an increase in abundance of birds further north with warming ocean conditions. And so back to the uh, yeah, sea ice topic. As I mentioned, 2018 was the lowest extent recorded since 1978, since they began recording sea ice levels in, uh, in oh, well, I guess, based on 
um, satellite imagery. Uh, so this figure on the left shows the 2012 sea ice extent, which extended from the Pribilof Islands. Uh, in the light blue is the associated cold pool, that thermal barrier of two degrees Celsius water or colder at the bottom, and generally restricts the, the migration of warmer water fishes like Pacific cod and walleye pollock to the southern Bering. So in 2018, with the reduced sea ice extent, the reduction of the cold pool uh, indicated there in the red in 2018, um, that was a fraction of the size typically. And this allowed Pacific cod and walleye pollock to move further northward than they had previously, and now could be competing with marine birds and mammals for prey items. I think this is a story that many of you have already heard. So. And it wasn't just a few cod and pollock, it was a substantial increase in the biomass of these two commercially harvested species. So wrapping up, uh, there are a lot of concerns about seabirds, uh, rapidly changing marine ecosystem, uh, including vessel traffic. The reduced amount of sea ice has allowed the increase of shipping of liquid natural gas through your region uh, with some vessels, some of those, you know, a thousand feet long and lit up like small cities traveling through the Bering Strait during winter months that previously would have been impossible. Uh, with the migration northward of commercially valued fish like Pacific cod and walleye pollock, we see catcher processor boats remaining further north than previously possible and remaining longer. And the US, require, US is required to remain south of the Diomede Islands, but fishing fleets on the other side of the Bering, not so much. Pollution plastics and contaminants, including biotoxins like saxitoxin are increasing and invasive species associated with warm water conditions are also a concern for disease as well. So climate change, and, and this is where I, I uh, here's some information. Here's your points of contact, myself um, and Liz Lebunsky with US Fish and Wildlife Service. Don't hesitate to give us a, an email uh, Andy Ramey, thank you very much, Andy, for your presentation um, for avian influenza. And then harmful algal bloom, I'm sharing information. Those results are from Caroline Van Himmer with the USGS Alaska Science Center. Um, and so those are some points of contact. Of course, the banner across the bottom are all the partners that have contributed to everything that I just shared with you, um, probably missing some of their icons. And then with regard to reporting, um, seabird die-offs, and so we, avian influenza, that's a concern, uh, but if you see die-offs of birds, uh, seabirds washing up on beaches, um, here's a list of folks, avian, or um, uh, the Alaska Migratory Bird Co-Management Council, we work closely with them as well, so these are some of the regional reps. You'll, you see Gay Shepfield's name there as well, Brandon Amasek as well, so, and then, um, my intent is to, try, I was trying to leave it on a more uplifting note. So Greta, uh, the one thing we need more than hope is action. And once we start to act, hope is everywhere. And that's the part where I think these animals are robust. We're, we are robust. Reporting what you see is just hugely important to us at the agencies, both the state and federal part, partners. Um, and so just remain vigilant and remain uh, active and make action, um, and then there will be hope. But it is kind of a, it's a tough topic to discuss because it's kind of um, depressing. <laughs> I'll leave it at that, and I chuckle, but it is, it's hard, it's a hard topic. So um, yeah, many thanks to your, to you all for your time. All right, well, thank you, Rob. I'm just getting the screen down here. Thank you, Rob. That is a die-offs are not a not a, a nobody likes a die-off, but it's good to hear what the causes were and that that people's actions are um, that you're bringing that information back. And I just like to point out that as much as you said my name, there are and I appreciate that everything that I've handed in has been from other people's work from all the community members in the Bering Strait region. Um, as well as you know, people from the that utilize the Leo network, um, coast do coast surveys for the birds, walk the beaches. So it's a it's a whole network of people in the Bering Strait region that come together to get uh, the authorities that are far from us get information. And um, 
because we need it back. And so thank you so much for bringing it back. That, that one's on you. So thank you. Um, we do have a caller on the line and caller, thank you for coming in. Know that I know I saw you come in, so you missed the avian influenza part, but we have not started asking our questions yet for the avian influenza. And you were able to catch the seabird die off. Um, and you have first cut, if there's at any time you have a question or anything like that, you just unmute and ask and we will stop because it is very difficult to be a caller on a Zoom call. Um, you may or may not have had the presentation. I emailed them to the tribes earlier, but I'm not sure where you're calling in from. I don't have the luxury of knowing that, but I see there's a caller on. So um, feel free to unmute and ask your question at any time. You can even step on someone and that's fine. Uh, we know it's- Good evening. Uh, I, I assume a gay Sheffield is talking. Yes, sir. Uh, this is uh, Robert Silic of Diamede. Uh, I just called in. I almost forgot uh, this uh, session here. I wanted to get involved with it because I live amongst a lot of birds. I we speak on uh, not only this island, uh, another island does too. Um, as you know, we that's um, our, one of our main sustenance during the summer. Uh, we usually get the birds with our poles and I know. I don't know if there, uh, you've answered questions or not, or when do we ask questions? I, have, I might have a few, though. Go for it right now. You're right in time. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, first, first question is: Are we um, in danger? Um, well, how do we know? Um, like I was just reading some parts of what you guys uh, were talking about and stuff. How would you know? If the bird is sick, our birds, um, it doesn't show anything at all, really, um, the disease or so. How would we know, though? Um, I know if they're dead, they're dead. You know, they're laying down, and uh, back in the past, um, I know there was not much of a talk about the influenza or the avian, um, but back in the past, um, before this become big almost every year so far now, um, one time we were boating, and this happened, one of our seabirds, the Crest Auklet, what you call the Tyok, um, we were boating, and it flew in front of us, and it was flying right in front of us, and it just suddenly dropped, all of a sudden just dropped right in the water. Um, we were curious about it. But uh, we didn't know about whether they had disease or not, because we're so used to birds living amongst the birds here. Um, so we picked it up, looked at it. It was dead. And not only once, but it happened two or three times. I've seen, I seen birds just plain drop off the air. And the other question was, that one question is, how do we know? Um, are we safe? Are we safe to um, eat these birds, which we have, which we consume every summer, or get? Um, so, Robert, I hear you. This is Gay, and um, thank you so much. So, we will get an answer here. Um, and just for people that might be listening in, Diomede is is the village is located in a seabird colony. So crested auklets, lee stocklets, puffins, kittiwakes, cormorants, a whole host of birds all around. Terribly oh, important. Oh, right. And in the Bering Street region, yeah. they're essential for food. So I don't know, Andy, is that a question for you? How, what behaviors might people see? Uh, what should they do? Thank you. And thank you, uh, Didi, for your question. Yeah, thank you for You're this. Welcome. Uh, question. Uh, uh, thank you for all, all your uh, comments and your observations too. So uh, for highly pathogenic avian influenza, uh, a common signs that birds may show will be that they look uh, as though they're losing coordination. So they may stumble or they might not be able to fly or uh, they might swim in circles or, or walk in circles. Uh, sometimes they uh, shake their head uh, uncontrollably, um, have what, what, what's called tremors. They, they're, they're sort of shaking their body. 
um, maybe they'll let you uh, approach them. So if uh, you can walk right up to a bird and that seems abnormal, um, that's a sign it could be sick. So often the birds will show uh, a behavioral sign that they're sick and they tend to die uh, relatively quickly. They may not dry, uh, drop out of the air, although they might try to fly away and have trouble flying away or be paralyzed and let you walk up to them. Um, but generally the disease happens very fast. It progresses quickly. So when they start to get sick, then they might die within a short time period, within hours or just a couple of days. Um, so, so those are maybe some things uh, uh, to look for. Um, uh, I'll say when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, your uh, subsistence practices and, you know, you ask questions about being safe. Uh, I work on uh, birds and, and not human health, but uh, from what I read on CDC websites and the information that I see from the CDC is that they uh, are currently reporting the risk to humans to be low. Uh, and so I uh, encourage you to pay attention to CDC guidance because that might, might change. But right now, the CDC is saying that uh, it's low risk to human population health. And um, uh, I think that's based on uh, so far, uh, despite people being hunting uh, like spring snow geese in the lower 48 states during this outbreak, um, the only case that has been uh, reported by the CDC so far has been one person uh, that uh, contracted the virus uh, that was involved with handling poultry. They were involved with handling sick poultry. Um, and uh, that person felt tired um, and, then, and then fully recovered. Um, so uh, again, uh, pay attention to anything that comes out from the CDC or you know, locally. I don't know if there's a, a, a clinic where information might be conveyed. Uh, but uh, that, I think, is uh, the current uh, situation, and, and hopefully that's helpful with regard to uh, signs of disease that uh, birds might show if they're affected by highly pathogenic avian influenza. So, um, okay. Andy, question is, if, if they see, say there people are at Diomede and they see the, I don't know, kitty weight can't walk right, um, I think the word would be to report it right away, um, to call. And uh, Robert, do you have a pencil? Um, one moment, I got one now. Okay, you wanna call, there's a hotline. The Fish and Wildlife Service has a hotline just for when you see something odd with the birds. And that is 1-866-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-6-
So um, they're asking dog owners now to sort of, you know, make sure your dogs aren't playing with foxes and things like that. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, Guy, uh, there was uh, one thing that uh, you mentioned, uh, foxes. Um, I, I experienced uh, one, uh, like you said, uh, it was, uh, it wasn't stabilized, it was uh, going crazy, acting funny, it was had like pretty rapid, um, it was during the spring, early, uh, early spring, when I just happened to go hunting up south and I ran into a fox just laying on the road, misbehaving real badly and stuff like that. Uh, I do believe we report it and send it in with the troopers or whoever was that, but we send that in because I brought it back to the island, uh, box it and everything. Yep. So, Did yeah, you get yeah, it's something, like you said, uh, they get dizzy, they wander all over, they drool and stuff like that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And one, yep. and one before that, um, last year, my my grandson and my son's uh, girlfriend and his granddaughter, uh, they were experienced uh, a kayak, a crest auklet on the beach, um, could not fly. I watched it too. I watched it for her. I just told them, just don't touch it. Don't touch it at all. Yeah. It couldn't fly at all. Yeah. An adult? Yeah. yeah, one concern, one of our big concerns is, you know, diamond has uh, about 30 to 40 species of birds that do come here annually, seasonally a year. Um, yeah, that's one of the concerns here, because, uh, as you know, a lot of us, most of us people from diamond eat our birds here, what we get. So, Thank you. Um, and not only that, uh, since I'm at this meeting, I'll, I'll uh, inform the village uh, and the parents about uh, the birds, what I'm going through. And while I'm having you guys, the meeting with you guys, um, I'll put that out on uh, English News or so, so the okay. families and the children, people of them could be aware of it. And I think, I think uh, some posters went out to the IRA office and they should be hung up today. So there may be some posters around as well um, with an update. So that's great. And, and I guess I have a question that, that might be, a, I don't know if these gentlemen can answer it, but if you are going to um, maybe eat eggs raw, you know, as you're hungry through the day, I know kids like to climb around, maybe not go home have a snack right there at the rocks. Um, can can you eat, are you, are we supposed to be eating the eggs raw or if we air dry meat from the MERS or meat from the, um, the auklets, can we, is that safe to eat or does it must be cooked? I've seen, you know, these things that say thoroughly cook your meat and eggs, but sometimes uh, that isn't the way meat's prepared. Is that, um, any recommendations on drying or raw eggs? I haven't heard any uh, recommendations on that, Gay, and I'm afraid that I can't offer recommendations on that. Uh, okay. uh, that's sort of out, outside of uh, my lane, so to speak. Yep. But yep. I can say that uh, you know heat uh, and cooking is very effective at, at killing the virus. So I, I think uh, you know a good rule of thumb is that uh, uh, high heat and cooking is is very effective at killing the virus. But I, I really can't speak if uh, um, you know, okay. the risk of, of raw foods. All right. Um, so I guess the word is, I, I think we probably will get someone else, um, maybe hopefully from Fish and Wildlife later this summer, if this really takes off to talk about those kind of questions. And I thank you, Andy. I don't mean to put you on the spot with that. I know that's not the, go ahead, Robert. There, there was one more question I had. Um, is there evidence, evidence on these birds of any sort Maybe something around the eye or something around the beak or maybe uh, bad spots or something like that. We should be uh, should be able to notice anything about them birds like that that have that influenza. Anything visual? Uh, the visual is very tricky. I think the, the two most consistent things that I've heard is, is neurologic signs, those things I described, those behaviors. 
um, and and just that birds die uh, quickly. So birds that you know are dead but in good condition. But I don't know of uh, very clear uh, physical signs uh, like you're asking about, Robert. That uh, we would be uh, clear evidence. Um, I, I think it's uh, it, it, it. There may not be clear signs. So I would mostly pay attention uh, to behavior. And and obviously, as as Gabe recommended, that if a bird is is sick or dead, it, it's better not to touch it and, and to report it. I think that's the most important thing. Um, uh, and because uh, if those carcasses uh, can be recovered and tested uh, in a lab, uh, that's really the best way in order for us to assess uh, if it's truly uh, influenza. So, um, yeah, that's a great question, but I, I wish I had an easier answer for you. Yeah, well, uh, one question after another, I better stop. But then there's one more I'd like to know about is uh, how long how long do you think uh, if a person got affected by it, um, you know, and how long will this uh, influenza be in the system? Uh, we treat it like any other flu, or that it had to be specialty uh, with the uh, health age here? here at our clinic, or is there a certain way we've got to treat or be near them or something like that? If someone were to get uh, affected by it. Mm. Uh, that's another excellent uh, question, uh, uh, and also one that is, is very difficult for me to answer, is, as I really uh, work with uh, birds and not humans. But I would say that uh, if you've been uh, participating in subsistence activities where you're uh, uh, handling birds or uh, um, uh, hunting birds uh, or very close to birds and you start to feel ill and, and feel flu-like symptoms, I absolutely encourage you to uh, seek medical advice and to uh, you know, talk with people in the clinic and to convey to people uh, that you've been uh, handling birds um, and then to explain uh, your potential exposures. I think uh, they will be able to give you the best advice and I think it's important to convey to them uh, close contact with birds. I think that will make it uh, helpful for them to understand uh, the situation. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I pretty much uh, thank you for your time. Um, that pretty much answered my questions here. But yes, I, I will let the. Uh, there's flowers around there, Gay, on okay. the village here. Uh, some people are aware. I think uh, we're going to have a get together sometime and uh, we'll let that out amongst, let them know again about our bird system here. Because, you know, our children here in Miami, they love to go birding too. Yep. And if it helps, mm -hmm. know that the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium and the Norton Sound Health Corporation here in Nome are fully aware of the situation and are, are on the case. And so if there were reports of dead birds at Diomede and then there were reports you know, if somebody was sick, um, certainly we'll try to get, maybe we can get a speaker from the Center for Disease Control that can actually answer people questions or maybe from the Department of Health and Social Services Epidemiology that are allowed to answer human health questions. Andy Ramey and Rob Kaler, uh, just by the nature of their jobs, they, it's, they are not allowed to answer human health questions because they deal with birds. So we need to get the, those kind of, I, I see that's a really topic that we need to also bring in and, and as great as these guys are, they just can't answer those questions. Um, but I can tell you that Norton Sound Health Corporation for us in the Bering Strait region are on it as is the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. So they are taking this very seriously and are involved um, as this avian influenza is, um, I, I guess we're all trying to figure it out. So I, if that helps answer your question that we are not alone on this and the our healthcare locally, regionally are aware. So know that. Yeah, yeah, that did answer my question, but I'd like to get more specific on, you know, yep. uh, disease, because like I said, we live with the birds here during the summer. And, uh, you know, that's one of the concerns that got me thinking, for a while we've been having been hunting these birds and all of a sudden they have this influenza. You know, it's just something that, uh, it's just like, uh, that doesn't really phase us at all, but that's what we consume 
we ate this and, you know, um, for thousands and thousands of years, we've lived off the land and the sea. So now that due to climate, it might have the effect, the effect of a climate change. Maybe that's why we're seeing all these changes that's going on. And not only that, uh, I encountered uh, a pigeon guillemot, which we have abundance here. Um, they come here too with the birds. Uh, I just happened to be out hunting uh, early spring, and I was observing looking for uh, seals uh, in the water amongst the ice and stuff. And uh, I just encountered a uh, pigeon guillemot, which was camouflaged. I see it black and white, and uh, I watched it for a while. It dove, and I looked around for a while, still hunting. I looked back at that bird, come right back up. It was eating algae. I was like, wow, this is the first time I ever see a bird eat algae. Interesting, interesting. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. You're welcome. Um, that, that, was, that was one of my concerns, though, and whatnot. So that's all I have for all. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and um, stay on the line in case you have more questions or, or whatever. It's good to hear your voice. I will. Yep, thank you. All right. Any other questions from everybody? Thank you, Diomede. Hi, Gay. This is Linda in Unalaska. Um, thank you, Rob and Gay and Andy, for all the information tonight. I am a, a recreational birder and I, um, I just love them so much. And, and I'm, uh, I found a, the, uh, an eagle that was very ill um, a few weeks ago. I don't know if it was the first, but it was one of the first that we found, I think here on the island, we might know, um, and called it in. And of course took my dog, fortunately, who was on a leash and went far away and let them take care of the animal. Um, I recently saw a pigeon Gilmont and I um, was with another birder and he looked very sick swimming in circles. They don't usually come up to shore. And so it was very strange behavior. And so I called it in as well. Is that um, all we can do? I mean, and, and of course, if that is, that's of course, we'll continue to do so, but um, to take pictures and, and call the number. I will let Andy and, and Rob answer that, but at least for us, uh, that's what we're instructed. Now that may change um, for some, some people in some regions um, with training, but go ahead, gentlemen. Uh, maybe I'll take a stab and then I'll let Rob fill in the blanks that uh, uh, from my perspective, I think that's, uh, uh, first I wanna thank you for your previous reports and uh, uh, those, uh, uh, that bald eagle, uh, was a very important data point, I think, for Alaska. Um, and uh, I really appreciate the two that you called in uh, the pigeon uh, guillemot. And I think, um, uh, uh, you know, per your comment, um, th th those are huge contributions. And, and uh, I personally thank you. And I think, you know, uh, the agencies, there's, you know, this response to this outbreak is uh, many different agencies involved. And I think uh, all agencies are really, uh, appreciating uh, responses uh, uh, such as uh, um, you provided there uh, by, by calling in those birds. And I, I do think that your observations and you know, photos and videos are really uh, great resources. Uh, some of the observations that have been shared through like the LEO network, I think are some of the best images to document what an outbreak and what uh, effects of even influenza uh, look like or can look like. Uh, that exist. So I, I think um, these observations, uh, not, not to uh, trivialize these contributions of uh, reports and observations, I think they are uh, 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 serve a, uh, a, a great, um, uh, serve as great contributions uh, to us all. So uh, thank you for those. And I, I do think just, you know, in order to uh, maintain uh, health and safety uh, uh, for, you know, the general public that it's, it's probably best to have, you know, trained personnel respond to uh, uh, these die-off events. And, and I think that's why guidance uh, has been what it is. Um, uh, and, you know, things might change moving forward. 
Um, but I think as of right now, um, essentially, yes, you know, uh, calling in observations and making observations and, and recording those um, and recording anything about the context that you feel is important, you know, what uh, other birds might be around, are they healthy, are they sick, um, you know, documenting the extents, if, if, you know, this is one sick bird that you saw, at, but you saw hundreds of other healthy birds, that's use for, useful information in your report, or that, you know, you saw one dead bird, but some others were acting abnormally too, that's really helpful too. So I'm, I'm going to stop there and let uh, Rob maybe offer uh, any other uh, comments you, you care to. Yeah, thanks, yeah, Andy. They tell me they tell me the state of Alaska is the size of Texas, California, and Montana combined. So, and then I think I said 34,000 34, miles of coastline. So that's a we really depend on all of our partners to contribute. So the value, even if it's just, and I shouldn't say even just, I should say thank you, as Andy was pointing out that all of those observations, the the map that I had up earlier for the coast. Uh, coastal observation, seabird survey team. You know, it's just the people that are taking the time to report these observations that help us monitor this over the duration, be vigilant, continue to report. And then it's not just one species. So you've identified two different species. So that's another important you know, factor that we need. We as the agency trying to, trying to manage these events. And um, I think we, you know, I, working closely with Andy and years before, it, we are concerned about disease, and in this case, highly pathogenic avian influenza coming either from the Asian side or this one appears to be coming from the Atlantic side and birds coming back to Alaska. So it's a global mm -hmm. issue, but yeah, we really were, were so indebted to community members like yourself, Linda, providing that information. Um, and then I, I know I've, I've already used gay's work net. Yeah, gay, gay, gay. But I'm a cheerleader for gay because she really <laughs> helps get that. That's very nice. Wish my boss was on the line tonight. I, 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 I'm <laughs> writing a letter to, to him or her uh, okay. right now. Um, so thanks. So uh, Linda, I guess for us, the, the short story is we, we say out here, report them, don't touch them. And I guess, right. uh, and, and I, would, I would tow that line right now until told otherwise. Um, and and actually, you're a dog owner, and and I guess on Alaska, man, you guys are getting it all. So now you have the one fox in a, in. Um, you heard about that, the red fox on right. your, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, I guess now they're telling us to be, you know, make sure it's going to look like rabies in 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 uh, the foxes, and so mind your dogs, mind your cats, and all that, because we don't want it to uh, jump again into dogs and that would make it even a little bit one step closer to jumping maybe uh into dog owners which we don't want oh goodness so, so right uh, watch your foxes and watch your dog i guess i'm a dog owner so i take that that um press release this afternoon that just came out pretty seriously and we have a lot of dog mushers that are talking about it right now as well does that answer your question linda it does. Uh, thank you so much. Um, in the one uh, sort of tag question in terms of the pictures or videos, like I, I did send them uh, via text. I think Bree ended up getting them um, at the office here in Alaska through Meg Dean, who as another person who's been volunteering with the birds. Um, is there a specific email to send them to or do I just call the number which I've now programmed into my phone that you gave us? Um, and they'll give me the email or is there a yep. person? That... Call, I would call, 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 and they will direct it to the right. They will give you the right email. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and for, um, I have here in my office, which we have, they've been hiding in the corner and they're so, they've been out in the field. They're just so glad to get in an internet uh, friendly place so they can check all their emails and listen to Rob Kaler and Andy Ramey, but we have, uh, Michael Henderson and Michaela Gustafson come in from the field. They're working on their deer falcon um, project. And so they, they came in specifically for this and they have been sort of, you know, hi mom, that kind of thing on the background. Mm -hmm. And, um, but they have a question. So, so they've been listening patiently. Go ahead with your question to these gentlemen. Yeah, I was just curious in comparing uh, historical outbreaks to this current outbreak and this transference to foxes. I'm just curious, uh, how common or rare it is to transfer into mammals? 
Uh, yeah, question. there's uh that is a great question. And uh, uh, I could probably talk uh, at volumes about that. So, you know, there's different types of influenza as I talked about, so I don't wanna get uh, too far into the weeds, but I would say that there has been precedent uh, with past outbreaks of both high path avian influenza and also these uh, sort of naturally occurring uh, avian influenzas that, you know, perfectly healthy birds maintain. Um, where uh, influenza viruses have gotten into mammals before. And that includes foxes. It also includes seals. It also includes whales. Um, so uh, this uh, spillover between uh, birds and mammals is, is not rare. It, it does occur. Um, but as, as Gay mentioned, uh, when viruses spill over into mammals, uh, for a reason, there's, uh, uh, tends to be a heightened concern about uh, further spread in mammals. So um, I, I think what's going on is not without precedent. Um, it, it's not unheard of, but it's also not extremely common. And it's something that I think uh, many different agencies and many different people are keeping a, a careful uh, watch uh, to see what, if anything, comes next, so to speak. Great, thank you, appreciate it. Excellent question, thank you. All right. Yeah, say, say hi to your mom. <laughs> <laughs> Will do, <laughs> will do. <laughs> okay, um, any other questions at this point? There's nothing in the chat that I've missed. And um, okay. Pete, go ahead. I see your hand raised. Um, yeah, this is Kate. Oh, hi, Kate. Uh, hi, Kate. <clears throat> I'm wondering about bird feeders. And a couple of weeks ago, I looked at the Songbird Institute website. And at that time, they um, were not recommending taking down bird feeders unless you had poultry, because the incidence in songbirds is very low. Uh, but that was a couple weeks ago. I haven't really investigated since, and I was wondering um, if that is um, still the recommendation. Oh, I'll just quickly say here in Alaska, Anchorage, we would pull your feeders down because of bears. Um, that's kind of, if you don't have any other better reason, yeah, pull your feeders down because you don't want to attract bears. Um, but maybe Andy has, um, a different perspective. Of course, Andy lives in bear country too. Yeah, I, I think locally, uh, absolutely. And uh, I think anywhere in bear country, uh, I would be concerned this time of year. Uh, uh, if one's not in bear country, I would say, I personally haven't heard of any uh, uh, federal uh, guidance uh, on this issue. I have heard various uh, private organizations and, and some states have recommended to take down bird feeders. Uh, despite, as you point out, uh, a very low incidence in uh, uh, passerines and, and songbirds. Um, so I would say my understanding is there's not sort of universal, here's what folks should do in the United States guidance on that. So I think you're doing uh, the right thing by asking questions and, and looking into what guidance is available. Uh, I'm afraid I can't offer uh, any uh, guidance from uh, you know, the USGS doesn't set guidance, so I, I can't convey anything from my agency, nor that I've, I've heard from uh, partner federal agencies. I, it's possible I'm just unaware. Um, uh, and it's possible that it's just uh, uh, differential guidance, depending on, on whom you listen to. And unofficially, uh, not representing U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, if you don't have poultry in your yard, you're probably okay to have your feeders out if you're not concerned about bears. But if you do have domestic poultry, just you know five or six chickens, then that might be something that you should be more. Um, I would I would think about that because that we do, and that's you know we're talking about land birds, the the songbirds, but those can be carriers of, of of viruses too. But so if you don't have chickens in your yard, I'm gonna unofficially say, I think your feeders are okay if you're not concerned about bears, attracting bears. Thank you both. And um, also thanks for great presentations. Which reminds thanks. me. Which yeah, reminds thanks for me. tuning in. Are we still recording?
We are. And which reminds me, I have forgotten in the excitement of having two speakers and such interesting topics. Uh, please give the speakers, show the speakers, Andy and Rob, a little love. Give them some comments in the kudo or, or kudos in the comment section or, or clap. It is not never easy. And they're taking time on a, on a Thursday night. They got to go to work tomorrow. And here they are helping the Bering Street region figure this out. So um, feel free to, to give them some love. Because it's like I say, being a speaker, aye, it's not easy. Tonight was um, pizza. Tonight was pizza night, so I'm well fed. But okay, uh, oh, yeah. Here's my question, which is a combo question that involves both of you, and that is for the last five years, multiple species of seabirds in this region, everything from cormorants, cormorants, kittiwakes, puffins. MERS, uh, shearwaters, a multitude of different birds have been starving to death and washing up on our shores throughout the region from Eastern Norton Sound, St. Lawrence Island, in front of Nome, Shishmaref, you name it. They seem to be in a weakened state of health. They, they're not feeding, right? And so they're, they're trying, but we seem to have this overarching food limited problem going on in the, both the Northern Bering Sea and the Southern Bering Sea, it seems. While the animals are struggling to deal with that, we are bringing in this disease. And I, again, I know it's sort of like, well, the birds aren't, you know, it's not in seabirds and that sort of thing. And that, that may be the case, but are we looking at something like avian influenza might gain traction in birds that are in ill, um, not ill health, but are in not very fit. They're, they're you know, they're on the margin of, of uh, they're hungry, they're emaciated, they are weakened. Is this something that needs, I mean, do we need to be realistic in, in, in looking at who might get, I mean, would the seabirds take a hit more because they are in a weakened state if this thing finds its way to them? I mean, yeah, so maybe many different I'll, types of birds. I'll, I'll... I'll open and I'll, I'll let Andy be more um, articulate than myself, but. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, the, the, if so, if we as humans become uh, compromised immune wise, we get sick, maybe we had something, we, you know, botulism, maybe we ate something that wasn't good, so we get food poisoning. Now our immune system is compromised. So just like us, birds, you know, can be the same way. So if they, for example, eat a tainted meal that had saxitoxin, the uh, saxitoxin associated with paralytic shellfish poisoning. So they eat that and they get very sick. Now they're dehydrated and they get better, you know, 24 hours later. But then if they eat another tainted meal and it might just be a very low, you know, just a little bit of, of saxitoxin, they eat it, they get very sick, but now they're dehydrated. That does make them of course, more susceptible to disease. Um, just like us, if we're, you know, if we're not sleeping well at night, you know, we're more susceptible to catch colds, things like that. So. Um, I guess, and then if you add something like, so harmful algal blooms, a biotoxin in the environment making them sick, um, plus they're actually working harder because there's apparently less food because they're either competing for that food resource, the forage fish, because now there's a bunch of um, cod or pollock that they're competing with. So now they're working harder to get a meal um, and perhaps that meal might be tainted. So it's the insult to injury and compounded. So we don't, I think I mentioned that we don't have a smoking gun, but we know birds have been in poor body condition that we've been able to get from our partners submitted to the USGS National Life Health Center. And so far those have not tested positive for disease, but that's something we wanna to continue to monitor. Um, and they have also not, you know, cause of death has not been associated with exposure to harmful algal blooms. Another thing that we wanna to continue to monitor. So that's, yeah, Andy, make that make more sense. <laughs> I know, I just, I, first, I, th I think, uh, I appreciate your question, Gay. I think it was an excellent question. I, I think uh, you tie a lot of things together there. And I uh, absolutely agree with uh, what Rob's conveying that, you know, I think uh, healthy ecosystems and, and healthy individuals are, are more resilient. And so I, I uh, you know, uh, some, uh, uh, some things are, are going to have a uh, uh, result in uh, injury or death. You know, even if a person is really healthy and they get hit by a pickup truck, they're probably going to die, right? But uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, 
uh, individuals that are uh, healthier and ecosystems that are healthier are going to be able to uh, be more resilient and be able to take uh, a combination of stressors, uh, um, uh, uh, different uh, uh, types of uh, disease agents that might cause uh, low level disease uh, or sometimes severe disease in certain circumstances. So um, uh, absolutely, I think uh, if the ecosystem is uh, in a less healthy state, then uh, there's potential vulnerabilities there. Okay, thanks for cheering me up there, Andy. But that's real, realistic. <laughs> Remain vigilant, Gay. Remain vigilant. You too, Linda. Well, Keep reporting your it's, whatever you observe it in Alaska and across the, the Bering. It's realistic, and that's what we need to hear out here. It's to be informed and to be prepared. This region does need to just hear what, you know, and you're doing a great job answering our questions, both of you. Thank you. Um, and we appreciate that. And I'm going to see if we can get down the line here some human health people as well. So I think it'd be great to have you maybe all come back with more even to tackle some of the questions. Any other questions? You got some nice kudos in the chat box. Uh, I have, I have yes, one. I do have one. Oh, go ahead, Diane. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I do have one here <clears throat> where I was looking at reading the statement. <clears throat> Here, my, my, maybe Andrew or Rob, or you might know about this. Um, here in the United States, it says right here, low pathogenicity, avian influenza is common in wild birds in the United States and around the world. What do you mean by low? I mean, we knew, did, did you guys know or did the people that studied knew all about this? Has this been going on for years and years, or is it just that something new that's happened here to to our birds, to the avians, or any animals are finding diseases like this? So good question, um, good question, Robert. And because yeah. you you know you came in late, I think I think that was covered. And Andy can tell you that it. And and I, Andy, jump in oh. here. That, that it seems like avian influenza, there's lots of different kinds and it's not um, not that we've never heard of it before, but there's different types of it, different strains of this virus. And then Andy, you tell us about this H5N1, which is the strain we're dealing with, which is a little different than the types of uh, uh, avian influenza types that have gone on before that are more common and kind of kind of a scare for chicken owners, but now we have a different thing going on. Yeah, thanks for that excellent question and, uh, and Gay for your uh, really good summary there too, that uh, there's lots of types of, of naturally occurring influenzas. So when you hear the term bird flu, it can be pretty confusing because there's lots of types of bird flu. And uh, some of these types of bird flu are perfectly normal. That is, you know, for decades, uh, researchers have been finding some types of uh, natural bird flu in, in birds. And so if you just hear that uh, a, a bird has a bird flu, then a uh, the, uh, follow-up question could be, is it the type of flu that makes a bird sick? Because it's only these highly pathogenic avian influenzas or highly pathogenic bird flus that tend to cause birds to become sick. And that's maybe a difference of what's going on currently is that mostly what we've seen in years past has been these naturally occurring influences that don't make birds sick and are perfectly normal. It's just now this highly pathogenic avian influenza that's causing some birds to become sick. So it is a little bit different and I appreciate that they can be confusing, but it's good that uh, uh, folks are here and, and educating themselves and, and many folks probably already knew this, um, uh, but to recognize that there's different types of, of bird flu and this particular type is, is proving problematic uh, to wild bird health. So, so bird flu is common, but this bird flu we got going on right now, this is a different kettle of fish, so to speak. It's a, it's a different strain and it's bothering the birds, the wild birds, and jumped into foxes. So everybody's watching this to see, huh, what happens now? So I'm glad you're on to get more info. Oh, thank, thank you, uh, Andy, uh, and uh, Gabe, for uh, answering the question. Um, there, was, there was just one more here 
um, like you like you guys say, um, the avian influenza or bird flu is a respiratory. Um, I just heard that you guys mentioned about different kinds of disease, and the birds. One of them is respiratory, caused by by influenza A virus. Um, how much do you guys know about this virus, and how contagious, and uh, how many viruses are there? Uh, are they different from C or from, like like you said, uh, um, the mainland birds, which are on the ground, die easily by this influenza? Um, you, what's the big Andy's the guy to ask. That's a perfect question for Andy. Okay. Uh, uh, Robert, I feel like we might have to talk for a few hours. Uh, I, uh, there are lots and lots and lots of types of bird flu, and researchers, including myself, have been studying these for many, many, many years. And so there's tons of variability. Um, and so I would say uh, uh, researchers know a lot about different types of flu, and I would say researchers even know a lot about this particular uh, highly pathogenic H5N1 influenza, but we don't know everything. Still, we're still learning things all the time. And so we do know that it uh, definitely causes disease and death and poultry. And we do know uh, uh, it causes disease and death in many species of wild birds, particularly raptors. And uh, we know that it's uh, also causes disease commonly in different types of waterfowl, and it's really spread readily among waterfowl. Um, but we also have lots of questions about uh, uh, how uh, it might persist in uh, different areas, how it, uh, why it maybe uh, affects different individuals differently, why it uh, affects different species differently. I mean, there's lots of types of birds, as you know, and uh, so to know everything about this virus and every species of bird takes a long time. So, uh, so we're gathering information as fast as we can, uh, particularly by you know, great reporting by people like yourselves that uh, are making observations and calling things in. Uh, and we're gathering as much information as we can. And we have a lot of information, but boy, we still have a lot to learn. So Andy, this is Gaze. So if we were to use COVID as kind of, since we've all been living with that virus, it, what we're saying is like pretend COVID was, you know, something that birds got, but now all of a sudden we got Omicron. Remember when that all of a sudden came out, everyone's like, oh my God, we got a new strain of COVID. What? But um, is this, this is sort of that we, we have these bird flus and now we just got this H5N1 and you're a geneticist. So it's probably really, really interesting um, and I, I'm sure you could go into whole detail later when you've got it all figured out about how it's jumping into foxes and, and changing up a little bit to do that. Um, so is that what we're is that what we're seeing? Like this is kind of like yeah. an offshoot of a main virus that we sort of know about, and then zip, this has actually changed it up a little bit more. Exactly. Something like Omicron, or you know, for birds. Exactly. So this uh, high path influenza we're dealing with now. In fact, uh, this is. Uh, Related to that uh, bird flu that people probably remember in 2005 and 2006, there was a scare about bird flu. This is uh, actually related very distantly to that same bird flu. So it's uh, it's uh, definitely uh, uh, evolving, just like you know Omicron did off the uh, original SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, this is uh, kind of similar. So things constantly change with viruses, and so. Uh, the one thing I'm sure of is this virus is going to continue to change and we're going to continue to have things to learn about it. So it's, uh, you make a good comparison there. And yes, I think it's comparable to that. Does that help Robert? Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, that is, uh, that is one of the questions too, what you brought up there, Gay, was, uh, very similar, maybe it might be like very similar to the COVID, which we're, have to experience being experiencing now, you know, it passes on to another person, whether it's on an object or on the clothing or on something like that. I, I I can see that the way you guys explain it on the illustrations and stuff, um, very similar. Uh, the, the, the diseases where it can be catch on from passed on from one place to another. Right. 
All right, how are our speakers doing? Are you guys, we're at eight o'clock. There are at least two more questions that I'm aware of. Do you have any other questions, Robert? Ask away. No, I don't. Uh, uh, thank you. Pretty, pretty much appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you great guys, questions, Robert. Thanks so how much. Are, how are you guys holding up? Okay. I'm, right. My belly is full of pizza. I had a pizza tonight. <laughs> All right. Well, we have another question from this end of things. Yeah, I was just curious whether you guys know uh, whether or not any agencies or organizations are uh, planning to do any sort of like systematic check for the prevalence of avian influenza out in this area, or is it just purely based on observations from the public? Yeah, so not a lot of surveillance going on. Uh, call us out. Thanks, Michael. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, there's not a lot of sur there's not a lot of surveillance at this point, and really, yeah, it's uh, I don't I prefer not to use the word opportunistic, but what we are looking at is is people it look like Linda dropped off, but getting those reports from community members. That's where we're at. And so there, there was an idea, perhaps we can swab some hunter harvested waterfowl, but um, we and Fish and Wildlife Service don't have the resources for that. And um, yeah, so here we are basically relying on um, reports. So right. I get to be the optimistic one to this question. So uh, uh, I, I think Rob uh, is being honest uh, and giving a sober response for current efforts that they're mostly what we call passive surveillance, that is observations, but that will change later this year. So uh, the USGS will, uh, we've been conducting annual surveillance out in Western Alaska at around Cold Bay every year for somewhere between 10 and 15 years now. And we will be doing that again uh, 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 this, fall, starting in late August, we'll start sampling uh, uh, live birds uh, through fecal sampling on, on uh, beaches and on mud flats. That'll be, you know, gulls and emperor geese. And then once hunting season starts in, uh, on September 1st, we'll start sampling hunter harvested birds and we'll aim to collect 1,000 to 1,500 samples. Uh, similarly, the USDA has an active surveillance program They'll be sampling hunter harvested waterfowl throughout the state. Um, and they plan on sampling another uh, 2,200 birds. So there will be uh, a lot more information uh, systematically correct, uh, collected to understand uh, prevalence, at least among waterfowl and, and some goals. Uh, but it's gonna be a little bit of time yet. Uh, that's probably not gonna ramp up until uh, late August or so, but should continue through uh, October. Great, thank you. And I certainly understand, you know, logistical and financial constraints on such a thing. You know, so thank you. All right. Yeah. Um, thank you. And thank you for that. I'm glad it sort of sounds like the cavalry is coming and lucky for them in Cold Bay and waterfowl hunters. Maybe we'll, maybe, maybe this region can um, benefit from some of that. I don't know how, but maybe that will expand. Um, and hopefully we won't have to, hopefully it'll just, we won't have any more of this, but, um, but thank you for that answer. My I have a, I have a quick question for you guys. Go ahead, Bree. Um, I was reading that in previous outbreaks that, um, that, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, happens to me all the time. You must be mine. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to uh, ask my question and you, you. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Go for it. Okay. So uh, my question is, we live in the Bering Street region. And regardless of geopolitical uh, situations, we are a neighborhood with shared resources. And we have there's kin, we share everything, all risks, opportunities, tonight's weather, we're sharing with uh, Chukotka. Is there any, I'm sure it's difficult right now, federal to federal, but you're, you know, all this talk is making me want to launch a couple things before they, whatever. But is to, are you guys communicating with our neighbors to the east? Are you communicating with Chukotka at all? This is a human, potentially human health that we've got it jumped in foxes this close to them. Um, is this something that there's a, a international sort of a line you can reach out over to our Chukotka neighbors? Uh, currently, uh, 
No, I'm uh, unable to reach across uh, that international line. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would say, I mean, the, the yeah, the, we're prohibited from government to government exchanges, but um, I can communicate to our non-government partners to share information. So I'm part of the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership, for example. We can share information that way, part of the World Seabird Union, so we can we can share what we have. Getting information back, um, it's I okay, have not, just yeah, yeah, I haven't heard anything back, but we can we can definitely share uh, non-government to government right now. Right, and I think which I'll is what we same. rely on a lot of our communications with our our Russian colleagues, anyways. But um, conservation of Arctic flora and fauna, calf, you know, that's that has been completely no more calf meetings right now. And I'm part of the Circumbolar Seabird Working Group for that. And so yeah, that's cut, but we can no share um, through our non-government partners. Right, okay. I, I do it, do it. Because there, this is a potential you know, livestock issue. This is a definitely jumped into mammals and we are um, 50 miles away you know, from when you're at, and Robert tonight is about a quarter mile from the border. Mm -hmm. So this is something that, that is, uh, you know, seriously needs to be shared in our neighborhood. And I say that as a neighborhood, not a geopolitical, you know, US Russia, but but people who live along the coast and are, are reliant on the maritime resources um, don't hold back. And I, I won't either. So I will, you're kind of getting me fired up to. Yeah, and, and the translation part too, of course, we don't have that capacity that's within okay. Fish and Wildlife Service, but that's, I mean, and I, <laughs> Just I speak Spanish and, and, and English, but um, I'm sure they speak multiple languages. But that I mean, is the other. That's and then the local local dialects. Uh, are, Canada's being informed, right? We're getting information back and forth with Canada, but our other neighbor needs to be informed. The people need to be informed. So anyway, um, thank you for that answer. That that is not possible through the federal channels. I understand why, but um, that just came to mind. We need to let Chukotka know. Uh, potentially yeah, there's a problem. Yeah, I mean, be sure to, yeah, all of those, um, I don't know if they can access the links that Andy pulled together and shared, but that would be the kind of, yeah, summarizing some of those pages even and getting that uh, shared through your, <laughs> we're not talking about leaking it, we're just talking about sharing nope, it. Just sharing. Um, so thank you very much for that. And I'm hoping, Bree, if that gave you a little time to regroup. Yeah, um, so yeah, what um, I was reading about AI a few weeks ago and I just saw that uh, previous outbreaks seemed to taper off around June or July um, in the past. And I was just wondering if you guys expect the same or if you expect something different with the highly pathogenic, highly pathogenic avian influenza. Uh, that's a great observation and, and question, Bree. And uh, um, uh, I, I might gonna, I'm, I might have to rely on uh, Rob to give a more uplifting uh, a answer after uh, I convey uh, my thoughts on this. Is that uh, lots of the uh, in, in previous outbreaks, uh, there have been uh, many detections at lower latitudes um, uh, throughout the world, where there's also a higher population density. And so uh, I've, you know, frequently heard about that uh, high path influenza disappears during the summer uh, up into Siberia and other northern regions and then reappears in, in the fall and winter. I guess I'm skeptical that it's really uh, disappearing and that it's just not that it moves to high latitudes in areas with low population density. So, uh, you know, obviously we have a fairly low population density uh, here in Alaska, but we also have lots of people distributed in uh, small communities throughout the state that are the eyes and ears for our state. And so um, I'm not convinced it's going to uh, disappear in Alaska this summer. Uh, maybe we're lucky and it does, um, but I think um, it's gonna be really important that folks like yourself are paying attention to what's going on the ground so that we can better understand uh, these dynamics and if it really is disappearing or if it's really an observer effect. Um, Rob, can you cheer everybody up now? <laughs> no, no, I'm just, just saying gonna, that's kind of, it sounds kind of grim. Uh, that I was going to say, yeah, no, it, um, the, the grimmer would be, 
Yeah, the lack, yeah. So even this, the seabird die-off maps that we have shared, um, they don't indicate where effort, where people are reporting, where we have people to report or observe. And again, by the time, you know, uh, somebody tells Gay Shetfield, for example, hey, I saw five dead puffins, and then Gay gets that word, and then Gay calls me, which she does every time at around five, a little after five after five, right, Gay? <laughs> she works all the time. <laughs> but it's, we don't have a lot of effort, and that's where we just hugely rely on partners to contribute those observations. So nothing, no uplifting notes here other than remain vigilant, continue to report. We really rely on you guys here in Anchorage um, for that information so that we can make maps and whether it's a high path AI or uh, just seabird die-offs, but we're being able to track it over time and, um, and report back to the communities with the, you know, here's the, here's the trends, this is what we're seeing. Uh, Gay starts calling me in June, stops calling me in September. Why is that happening? Well, um, you know, we're still trying to figure all that out. And now we've got the, the additional variable of a potentially highly pathog pathogenic avian influenza. So it's not a great answer, but yeah, we just really rely on you guys to, to share your observations and, and um, yeah. So, so it sounds like that you don't know how long it might be, but it sounds like it might go into summer and we should um, expect that and, and uh, prepare ourselves for that and be informed on what to do. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for this talk. It was great. Thanks. Where are you calling in from, Bree? I'm from Unalaska, Dutch Harbor. Wow, you guys, I don't know how you got on street science, but welcome. <laughs> yeah, are you, you're with fish and you're with fish and game, right, Bree? I am correct. Yeah. All right. yeah. So you've submitted some stuff to us. Welcome. Welcome. That's nice. We like to hear from the Aleutians. Mm -hmm. um, Megan, I'm just shot, giving a call out to you. Do you have any questions for these gentlemen? Megan is with the Gnome Nugget, and uh, or you might call them later. You know how to get a hold of us. She's unmuted. Megan, you might be, yeah, you're not muted. Anyway, we'll leave it be. She's muted again. All right, she may contact you separately. With that, any other questions? Thank you to the, the remaining audience that was able to, to stick with it. And um, I appreciate that. Yeah, she's having trouble okay. with her microphone. She will call you guys. She's having trouble at her end. All right, great job. Thank you, Megan. Okay. Um, and one more, one more. One more. Go. There, yeah, absolutely. Go for it. I mean, if you're calling in from Diomede and you're able to keep the phone that long going, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. yeah. Well, you see, the influenza, and um, this is happening throughout the years and years. Um, uh, you know, Andy and Bob. They may be working on that and studying and getting all the info about that. Um, I think that um, from the differences throughout the years, you have studied this uh, influenza. Has it get any worse? Has it improved? Has you know where are we at with that right now? Or is it at a little capacity where it's always been throughout the United States and maybe throughout uh, other countries? What a wonderful question. And again, I feel like uh, I would uh, love to have seven cups of coffee with you in order to talk about all of this. So we have seen lots of changes through time and uh, each year is a little bit different. And in some ways things are getting better, in some ways things are getting worse. So right now we talked a lot about one particular type of uh, influenza, these highly pathogenic avian influenzas, you know, H5N1, the sort of jargon, the subtype. And uh, just taking that one small sliver and go over the last 20 years, uh, there's been tremendous change in some ways better in some ways worse from where we are now. So when that virus first emerged, uh, uh, first uh, spilled over from poultry into wild birds, there were some big die-offs in East Asia um, where thousands of birds died and it looked like it was gonna be a big problem. 
And, uh, and that's why you might even remember there was this big surveillance effort going on in uh, around 2005, 2006. And what I say in some ways it was worse when that was going on, when people were becoming infected with this virus from poultry exposures, that is people that were handling infected poultry and contracting the virus, the number, the proportion of people that got sick, got really sick and died was a high number of people. So it was, it was a really serious disease in humans. But through time, it seems that now there's been less and less infections in people. But on the other side, now it's spreading more rapidly and uh, more geographically widespread in wild birds, and it's causing a lot more bird disease. So in that way, maybe it's getting worse. And so, um, so it's really been changing. Uh, uh, as I made a comment before, that I can uh, tell you for certain that this virus is going to change. That I'm sure of. Does it get better? Does it get worse? Well, what comes next? I don't know. But um, so in some ways it's better. In some ways it's worse. Uh, I, I don't know where we go, but um, uh, I think I can have a better sense of uh, uh, knowing uh, what comes next by, you know, great observations, great reporting by, uh, you know, people like yourselves helping us gather information and, and learning what's going on so we can maybe better understand what might come next. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for your great you. questions. You're welcome. That's all I have. Thank you. Yeah, I feel pretty lucky to have a Diomede uh, resident here for as long as we have. So thanks, Robert. They must have. Well, well you are, yeah, because, uh, you know, our phone system out here is not all that great sometimes. So, right. like with uh, Gates. And, uh, yeah, um, I myself pretty active for uh, Diomede. You know, I sometimes I can go on and on and talk and, and ask a lot of questions. Because I live here, and it, it affects this little island because we're so remote, and it's such a remote place and a small village. Um, of the, like we're very protective of our island, who we let in, because uh, they got to be in good health, you know, and uh, carry no disease or sickness in order for them to come here. They got to be approved by a corporation if they were to come here and visit. So we're very cautious about who we let in. Uh, because it's so small. So much the disease comes around, it's probably just going uh, to take over the whole village. So, yeah, that's one thing i like to emphasize that, too, there, and also about how, how we do things out here. Thank you, Robert. Um, with that, we do not have straight science next week. But we do have our next Straight Science on June 9th, and it'll be Bob Bolton from UAF Inter um, International Arctic Research Center. And he'll be talking about a permafrost study that's going on in the region here. So that we'll be learning something about the melt of permafrost and where we are with that in the Bering Strait region. I wanna thank Rob and Andy for giving us their time. And actually, if you guys wanna stick around for one second, while everyone gets off. And I thank the remaining audience that was able to make it through this. This, um, And I really appreciate the, the um, questions we got, lots of discussion. So thank you to our speakers again for that and to the audience for your uh, questions. So with that, thank you all and have a good night. <laughs>